Terrific. Well, good afternoon and good morning to those of you where it's still morning or good evening. Uh, you have come to the Venable MarTech Procurement Tips and Contract Guidance presentation today. So if that's what you were looking for, you're in the right place. Uh, we'd like to announce that for CLE purposes, the CLE code is MarTech, M-A-R-T-E-C-H 2021. Again, that's MarTech 2021. 21. Today, we're going to be talking about MarTech technology resources, and in particular, procurement. I'm joined by my colleague, Sydney West, who wasn't on the announcement, but she's associate in our uh, technology transactions and ad law practice group. And she's going to be taking us through some of the background on what MarTech is, and that will lead us into a discussion where we'll go through tips, observations, procurement process advice for obtaining MarTech resources. Welcome, Sydney. Yep. Thank you, AJ. So marketing is done uh, from a variety of channels, which can be done traditional way, uh, traditionally or um, through the use of digital technology. So anything that is a platform, a software as a service, hardware, uh, or uses digital technology to further marketing efforts is what is considered MarTech. So traditional forms of MarTech include uh, CRM, which is customer relationship management, uh, marketing automation, ad delivery, but essentially uh, any tools that help optimize uh, or identify marketing efforts is MarTech. And so a combination of those tools or solutions uh, to achieve a particular marketing outcome uh, is known as a MarTech stack, which I'll discuss um, on the next slide. So these uh, different tools or solutions uh, are the different offerings that MarTech vendors or providers um, provide to clients in, um, for, um, the tool or the combination of tools uh, that a client needs depends on the business objectives. Uh, so for example, if the objective is to just get the word out using an advertising um, promotion tool or solution would be beneficial. So that's like uh, social media marketing, paid media, programmatic advertising, whereas if the objective is to analyze and review touch points along a uh, customer lifecycle, utilizing data or in, in data tools is probably the best objective. So those include things like mobile and web analytics tools um, or dashboards or data visual, visualization tools. Um, and so when you're trying to consider procuring a MarTech technology, focusing on what your objective is is probably the best. Next slide, please. So prior to 2020, uh, MarTech as an industry experienced exponential growth. Uh, and so even though in 2021, spending in marketing technology has decreased, uh, a significant portion of um, marketing department's budget still goes to MarTech. Um, and because of that, it's still growing. Uh, and so now that a lot of, uh, I guess, information is related to customer data and data is the big focus. A lot of tools and vendors um, are focusing on data. And so uh, with that growth and focus on newer technologies um, comes a lot of uh, potential issues, especially with regards to implementation and integration of those tools into uh, your systems and applications. Uh, however, those issues can be mitigated uh, through through thoughtful planning, through the procurement, implementation, and renewal phases, which uh, AJ is going to discuss. So we're gonna take you through a process flow for more tech procurement. If you have any questions along the way, feel free to enter them. We'll either try to address at the end or we will follow up. Um, and what you're gonna hear from us is sort of a recommended process flow or best tips and observations that we obtained from the industry during calendar year 2020. There was an explosion in MarTech uses, uh, particularly with everyone being home 
for COVID. And so we canvassed a number of uh, industry leaders to hear what they were saying and doing as it related to MarTech procurement. Uh, what you're going to hear from us are both business and legal considerations. Um, we frequently heard that success for MarTech procurement was defined often as better utilization. So although we'll be addressing contract considerations, that isn't the endpoint for MarTech procurement. And I think that's important to emphasize for the legal counsel on the phone. There needs to be business involvement and consideration along the way. And what you're also gonna hear is that some of the best process considerations are actually occurring prior to contract negotiation. And we're gonna start there. So what are your initial considerations when it relates to MarTech? Uh, you wanna consider first, if you're gonna be using existing internal resources, resources that your company or organization can build out itself, or if you have to go procure them from a third party source. This might seem obvious, but MarTech, at least over the past two, three years, seems to be an area where there's a lot of extra and sometimes unwanted expense. And so we're gonna be emphasizing quite a bit the sort of value proposition of using some of these tools. So prior to vendor selection, it's really important to think about some of these things with your internal resources. Uh, many of the later issues that arise with respect to MarTech utilization, some of those are you know, misused, dispersal, uh, silo data, integration hiccups, cost overruns, or just generally lack of business utilization can be you know, prevented or avoided by spending a little bit more time up front analyzing and evaluating your existing stack or your proposed needs and considering what vendor options either you have or are out there to make a purchase decision. We would recommend creation of a team of stakeholders. So you would want a resource from legal marketing group, obviously, but also consider pulling in someone responsible for procurement as well as your IT support or IT expertise as well. Next, you want to look at your market, MarTech stack. Uh, we have found that it's helpful actually to visualize this by diagram form, see how the pieces fit together. Uh, you need to understand what your actual needs are here. Uh, this is a technology space where it's pretty easy to sell people on the prospect of value coming from these resources or tools when sometimes they do more than you need or you're not quite ready for them to be used at all. And so sorry, bear with us for a second. You can still see. Um, so as I was saying, some of your initial considerations are whether or not you're starting from scratch, uh, you're going to want to plan out what your stack is, what tools or solutions work together, focus on data flow, but oftentimes what you're really doing is adding to an existing stack. You may already have technology resources that perform our tech functions. Uh, many of you might have been using ad tech, which these days is sometimes considered a component of MarTech. Review your stack and its capabilities to ensure that the tools are optimized. Confirm what you need or don't need first. Oftentimes, we are finding that existing stack resources have additional or underutilized features or resources that you don't need to pay extra for. They're just not being used. And so take a look at what your needs are and what you you need to procure. Don't rush these steps. Have defined objectives. Why do you want a tool or solution? What criteria you're going to use with respect to procurement in terms of assessing whether you need something else and how its uh, procurement value is going to be justified in any respect. You get to define what success is here, but we would encourage all to go through this exercise so you can understand how to integrate MarTech in your stack. It's again, easy to get uh, sold to buy more than you need. And many of these solutions, technology tools do quite a bit. Uh, oftentimes 
they do more than you need. And so we're trying to emphasize value here. Initial questions to ask during these this sort of planning phases would include, you know, what are you trying to achieve with your smart sector technology? What does a new tool or resource do for you that existing tool or resource doesn't? How are you going to measure success of both the implementation and the later use of this new technology? Who will be using? Sometimes you'll need to have internal and external users, contractors, et cetera, agencies. Um, have you align all the various stakeholders on your MarTech team around this new procurement initiative? Everyone comes into it different perspectives, cost, marketing utilization, advertising promotion, et cetera. What processes can your MarTech technology enable, accelerate, automate? I think the emphasis here needs to be on improvement. So if something isn't going to make something more efficient, faster, cheaper, needs to be evaluated more closely as to whether it's needed. What data sources will need to be linked and integrated? This is critical. There, we're not gonna be talking at length about privacy issues associated with MarTech. Most of the MarTech data is coming internal, so you're already managing it and accounting for its compliance. However, how it gets utilized, shared, et cetera, still is important. So it is critical that you map all this out in advance. Again, what core technology, legacy core technology, can you integrate initially or use going forward? What other new technology components do you need to get? How will data flow from both in-house and newly procured or from applications offered by data different providers? Again, you're mapping this out. You can see how these questions can become quite technical, which is why we emphasize the need for bringing in that IT resource early so that you can better understand these points. And then finally, where will the data be housed? Usage of sharing is one issue, but storage and security is another. You will likely need to own these things, but occasionally you might be using a third party host or server. Where will the server be located? How will it be shared? Who will have access? What controls for security are in place? These are all questions you need to consider up front because you will not necessarily be seeing a contract that will emphasize or illustrate all these points. So now that you know what you want, you need to move into the next phase of determining where to get it and from whom. So this is vendor selection. If you don't have one vendor in mind, um, Consider using an RFP, but it's certainly justified to be talking to your industry colleagues and everyone has particular resources that they like or dislike or that seem to be working. They may not work for you. So you need to personalize this decision. Uh, you're gonna wanna think about whether you need to include your own company's contract terms conditions with the RFP. Doing so can begin the negotiation process step here, which can be advantageous and streamline it later. It will also sort of draw out whether or not you'll have an opportunity to use your own contract form versus the contract of your vendor. Uh, so if you have standard procurement terms you need to utilize, even if that's only a component of the contract, this is a great time to bring it into the equation. You need to think and focus on what your non-negotiables are. Narrow down your vendors on this basis. There is no need to continue discussion with a vendor that simply won't be meeting your non-negotiable, but you decide what your non-negotiable is. That's personal to the company or organization. So you need to consider early on if there are particular contract clauses that you need to require, that all vendors of your organization or company need to include and implement. Some of the vendors will not accept them. So you need to make this determination now whether you can proceed. You also need to decide if it's mission critical or material to proceed with a vendor or not. Use this as a part of your narrowing decisioning so you won't waste time later negotiating something that simply can't be negotiated. If it's non-negotiable for you, it may also be likewise non-negotiable for your vendor. So this is a great time to work through this process step now rather than dealing with it from the contract. When you're evaluating the vendor's tools as a part of this process step, we would encourage you not to focus precisely on what the current offering is, but also what the roadmap for the offering is. These tools are undergoing constant evolution. And sometimes it's more important to know that a tool will have utility one, two, three, five years down the road rather than what it is today. 
So ask questions through your RFP or otherwise about the vendor's roadmap. Is the vendor investing in the tool? You know, where do they see themselves in the future? How do they fit with other applications that are commonly in use? How do their MarTech technology solutions work with data or current data issues? These are important conversations to have and to draw out now prior to the contract. Focus on interoperability early. Request to speak sometimes to the vendors, engineers, or technology resources. Put your two I teams together. Discuss how a new tool from our tech will integrate with your existing stack. This is critical. I mentioned early on in the beginning the need to sort of diagram your stack to see how the pieces all fit together. You have to work through this point now. It simply can't be addressed later. Um, usually these discussions will be valuable because it'll be apparent earlier on whether interoperability is going to be a problem or not. Uh, I will say that there has been improvement in this respect over even the past two years, whereas before things tended to be developed in more of a silo way. Now there is more emphasis on more comprehensive solutions or solutions that obviously work with existing platforms or tools that you already have. So I would say this is an issue that's improving, but it's still one to work through early on in the vendor selection process. Don't be afraid to ask for demonstrations. Face-to-face uh, -face demonstrations in particular, and obviously that was less hard to do, but it's coming back or even through Zoom, it's a great opportunity to have all the various stakeholders of your team ask questions, see how the tools used, et cetera. Uh, so if there's opportunity to do this, we would certainly encourage use of it. Have a clear understanding of what the implementation implementation timeline will be and what your ROI will be from the tool. Everyone that we talked to said the implementation can take a lot of time. And so you need to understand that because you could find yourself implementing from one tool into another and then automatically have to be thinking about a later implementation as things have evolved. So work through these issues now. Uh, you know, vendor assessments of our tech tools really need to be evaluated on timing and cost. In terms of ROI, again, that's something for you to evaluate, but we would encourage you to come up with what your own metric would be. Is it better campaign performance? Is it more customers? Is it more sales? Is it just simply less cost or more efficient operation? Or is it better utilization by your own team? I don't know what ROI will be for you, but it's important to define that as it relates to MarTech tools. Some more specific points to work through, some of which are gonna be detailed in your contract, it would include data use and ownership. Ask the vendor for a detailed explanation of how the data is gonna be collected, what type of data is being collected, who gets to own the data, what rights the data will exist, what tools are there to visualize or analyze? Who's managing the data? What kind of security is in place? You'll probably be bringing in a privacy resource for this, but it's important to work through these points. Again, oftentimes, if not always, this is your data, but these tools are designed to work with third-party sources. So you need to map this out. Not all the contracts that you will see are very clear about data use and ownership. So this is a great opportunity to address you may need to incorporate an information security or data privacy addendum. Many large organizations have this now. And so this is something you need to be thinking about as a part of your vendor selection. Maintenance and support. This kind of boils down to what kind of support models are available to you. Is it all remote? Will it be in person? Are you paying by the hour? Are there simply general call lines or assistance resources that you're leveraging? Is there a specified managed team, et cetera? Uh, again, you may not always see the detail you want on this point. You may only encounter a contract that speaks to the licensing of a particular MarTech software application or platform. So you need to ask these questions because it's not so much that we've encountered a lot of support issues. In most cases, you're dealing with a SaaS tool. So support is kind of generally managed, but at the same time, you might have utilization implementation or other types of support questions. Data storage, again, relates to data use and ownership. Where is it being stored? How, where, who has access? You might be leveraging your own resources, in which case 
you don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but it's important to clarify. Your contract can sometimes allocate responsibilities for security to you. And so you need to deal with this. And the flip side, the vendor might be bringing in a third party resource to manage. So it's something to think about and talk through. Integration, again, this can take a lot of time. So, you know, can your products that you currently use be incorporated? Is there a need to work through integration problems and are those going to be likely to occur and take a lot of time? Data compatibility, data incorporation, et cetera. Fees, costs, obviously a business point, but we really would encourage you not to accept pricing that isn't itemized. It's very easy to be upsold at a fixed amount and pay more than you really need. And obviously from the vendor's perspective, they're gonna to want to sell you on the simplicity of that point. It may be an appropriate figure, but you need some way to itemize based on product service offering and also utilization. Uh, so really think about what the fees are, what the hidden costs might be, and whether there's opportunity for cost over around. This is a conversation that's going to work both ways, but it's one you're going to want to work down through the details. Again, KPIs mentioned earlier, you need to find them and then you need to talk through how they're going to be measured. They may not always be measured through a report through the contract. We're going to talk a little bit later about how the parties can get together to discuss some of these points. But the key is here is to have some KPIs to measure performance and utilization because that will give you a sense of whether or not your procurement is providing value or isn't. And again, security, data security is critical. Something needs to be managed, but you want to think holistically about this topic. It's not just about securing data. It's also about having security tools for access, who has privileges to view, et cetera. Okay, now you've reached the contract negotiation stage. You've selected a vendor. Uh, you need to consider reasonably what your relative bargaining power of the vendor is going to be. Are you dealing with a startup or a market leader? I can tell you now that with market leaders that have resources that everyone likes to use, it's going to be much harder to get in negotiated changes. They have forms that you will be likely to follow and you're going to have to learn to live with them. It's also important to keep in mind what the relative cost structures are here. The less fees associated with the MarTech tool, the less opportunity you're gonna to have to negotiate a change within the contract. You might likely be dealing with an online set of terms to merely accept. Don't be surprised if you're presented merely with an order and you're not actually receiving any contracts review. So you're gonna to wanna to understand your bargaining power, but you're also gonna to wanna to have a clear sense of what all the associated contracts are. Have them sent to you as a package rather than being presented with an order that merely cross-references to various policy statements or contract terms. If you can use your own contract, this is the place to incorporate the RFP terms that you brought in or to deal with your contract along with the MarTech tool terms itself. Stay focused on what's important. If you don't have opportunity to massage the basic license grant or some of the other terms, you certainly can talk about rights, ownership, identification, warranties. You may or may not be able to negotiate those things and have them added specifically to a contract, particularly if you're dealing with a set of online terms. But you can use other documents, such as an order, to create superseding terms. So I don't want to dismiss the opportunity for negotiation. I just want to emphasize, stay focused on things you can control when you're presented with vendor terms that you have less ability to alter. I would only advocate use of a term sheet in these scenarios if it's going to help clarify initial positions. I think you're better off with an RFP as a part of vendor selection. You, you gain a lot more when you're assessing multiple vendors as opposed to simply working on a term sheet to address contract terms. So I, I would say they don't tend to be helpful or more efficient, uh, but certainly if that's a practice of yours, you can try and talk about it early. If you need to add on additional terms simply because they're not addressed, so you're presented with a SaaS tool, but you have additional support needs, et cetera. You need to think about whether you can bolt on your MSI or other enterprise license agreements and how you're gonna do that. 
Um, again, this is going to depend a little bit on the size of the vendor and whether they're willing to work with your contract form or not, but certainly large organizations have procurement documents that they're going to want to use. They may be insisted upon by your procurement folks and your financial folks. And so think about the cost advantages of doing this. Certainly those document forms or versions will be more advantageous to you in terms of having fee controls. If you don't have those present in your document, that's where it's important to have a clear understanding of what the fees are, how they're being assessed, what caps, et cetera, are in place. Moving a little bit deeper into the contract negotiation itself. Here's a couple tidbits we picked up along the way that may or may not help you. For the termination clause itself, we would encourage you to try and negotiate some type of walk away right. And if possible to have that earlier on in the term rather than later. So what we mean by this is functionally a termination for convenience right. Most vendors will not want to give you one as a matter of course. So it'll be rare to always have the ability to simply have termination for convenience at any time, even if on some period of notice. They're going to want to lock you in to some kind of recurring subscription period, usually a year, sometimes multi-year. It may also be a situation where true implementation of the MarTech tool itself is going to take time, possibly longer than a year. But what we still would advocate for is that you have an early termination right. It's sometimes apparent early on that a tool simply isn't going to work. Even though you went through the vendor selection and the assessment of need, this is where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. And so you're gonna to want to assess early on. And if you can have something akin to a termination after an evaluation period of sorts or a pilot period, we would encourage use of that. You, you wanna test drive a tool in practice. And so it's almost as if you're setting up an initial term that's very short, then rolling into more standard renewal cycles later. For payment, we would tr emphasize trying to tie payments to performance, so to speak. So tied to a timeline, a schedule, some type of benchmark, again, tied your KPIs as you've defined them, instead of payment on just a renewal basis or a periodic cycle. Uh, there's no accountability if you do it that way. So if you tie it back to performance, it's easier to manage a little bit, especially if there's an initial period of implementation that's going to be lengthy, where there's more service performance involved. If you're simply using a tool that's a plug and play SaaS solution, you may have less opportunity to negotiate this. But if you can, and think about this specific to your need or situation, be particular as to timing, et cetera. Remedies, and we're specifically talking here about service remedies primarily or, or payment remedies, less so than legal remedies. You're gonna to wanna to have a contract that allows you to bring claims as needed. So you'll wanna typically be mindful as you would in any other commercial contract with liability caps, notification, et cetera. But you're gonna to wanna to emphasize if there are ready remedies available for your, and this is typically in the form of credits or refunds. Uh, easy to trigger if services fall below expectations, can also be used to sort of drive service and performance. Vendors don't want to be coming out of pocket for anything. Uh, if there is initial phase that requires service delivery specific to implementation, configuration, customization, this is a way to withhold until it's completed or meets acceptance criteria. Um, you want to avoid clauses that really limit a vendor's ability to escape poor performance or late performance. So think about these remedies. Uh, for those of you that have been doing tech agreement, this is akin to an SLA or some other type of schedule for service failures. But you don't need to define this strictly by uptime, so to speak, the concept of the solution always being available. Frankly, we haven't heard that's much of a complaint. Instead, you need to see if it's working, if there's some way to tie this to processing, et cetera. If you've been pr promised a certain level of performance based on the number of records, customers, et cetera, those are other metrics you can use to try and create a credit or refund concept. Uh, you're going to want to be very mindful of the limitations on limit liability. Damage cap should never be exceptions to carving out liability for things where the vendor truly is fault. 
Uh, so you want to be mindful of this. There will most certainly be pushback here from your vendors. You may be encountering a standard form. This is something where you can try and negotiate some exceptions. You want to hold the vendor responsible not only for their own conduct, but the conduct of any third parties they may be managing. Yes, you need to account for what they can actually reasonably control, but be mindful of blanket waivers, blanket releases, et cetera. Transition assistance can be very important upon termination and removal or migration of data or transition from one solution performing a mission critical task within the marketing department to another. So we would advocate that there is some accounting for this in your contract. Uh, you certainly have seen this if you've worked on other types of SaaS offerings or software support needs. So add it here. Uh, it can be helpful even if per the first point above, you're just accounting for a pilot phase. There's always some need to sort of migrate or move away from a current vendor to another. This is rarely a situation where you flip the switch and turn off one thing and turn on another thing. So transition assistance is important. Uh, SLA uptime requirements, again, tied to remedies. Specify how reporting will be done. How will you know that the vendor is meeting its performance obligations? Uh, they will typically be controlling and asking for control over reporting. So have some ability to track this. If you're using a KPI other than this, as I mentioned, you get to define what that is sometimes, or at least attempt to have a reporting that meets that. Uh, push for you know, meeting that threshold and some ability to see into this as you're moving along. Okay, so you've made it through the contract negotiation. First step is implementation. Not quite out of the woods just yet. This is the critical phase, really important that you put some time and effort into this. Uh, you wanna integrate these tools we found and heard in a fashion that's quick, both to avoid gaps in performance or gaps meeting customer needs or gaps in getting out marketing, but also because it tends to help with utilization. If necessary, this is where you want to think about having additional consulting support if it's needed. Uh, that may not be something that you're being told you need. Oftentimes, you'll be marketed a product that is easily implemented, so to speak, or easily customizable. But there may be need for additional support and expertise. And so we would advocate thinking about this. This usually is going to be a separate charge above and beyond standard support and maintenance that's available under more fixed fee arrangements. So it's something to discuss. Uh, be prudent here, no need to go over the top with how much you procure, but it is something to think about. Uh, we like the idea during the implementation phase from based on what we've heard from our industry sources that creating tiger teams is a great way to disseminate knowledge about a new tool. Again, Utilizations can sometimes be a challenge with new MarTech tools. You know, the simple fact is that sometimes people just don't know how to use it or use it to its full capability. So you might be explained something by the vendor, the tool is capable of performing that, but nobody knows how to do it. And so we have heard that the creation of a tiger team is the best way to disseminate this knowledge base. A small group, your tiger team will learn the tool utilization, and there'll be heavy emphasis and training for this group. And then that group is there as an additional support resource so that you're not constantly going back to the vendor. So it's almost as if you train a trainer with your own team so that they can help other employees within your organization or company use the tool. MarTech utilization is a problem with these tools. They're too new, changing too fast. And so their capabilities usually far outseed people's ability to use them simply because they do too much. And so trying to focus on training and getting that knowledge out there and how to emphasize and use MarTech is critical. And so think about having these tiger teams to sort of help distribute that information. You want the training to occur as soon as possible because you're gonna have to train and take some time to train as you move through organization. And so get the training done early with your Tiger team. 
Bear in mind that your tiger team isn't always just marketing. It could be IT, so they know how to help support or refer support. And so get that training done early, otherwise people forget. You run the risk with some of these solutions of having it sort of sit on the shelf being unused, paying for something that you don't need. So the more you know about it, the more that knowledge base is shared, the easier it is to get it used. Don't assume ever that these tools are easily learned or that your online resources presented as a matter of course with your support is going to enable your employee base to make use of these tools. Further, every tool is a little bit different and how it's used within an organization can sometimes vary. So how it might be used by one company might be different from another company. And how it has been configured for one company might necessitate changes in training for a different one. So have that Tiger team distribute and disseminate that information on training as best you can, and then get the training out early. Uh, we have seen rewards programs encouraging you to be very effective here. You know, free lunch if you come to this training for this new product. You know, you've paid for it. It's designed to make something more efficient or better or cheaper, but you got to get people to use it before you get there. Business reviews. Again, you've already procured the solution, but that's not the end of the story. You want to stay in touch with your vendors. For better or worse, these solutions are not so standard that they don't require ongoing conversation. Remember I mentioned at the beginning, you have a, a sense of what the roadmap is. And so you want to be holding your vendors accountable to that. And we found that having this ongoing communication optimizes the relationship a lot better than having negotiation at the initiation and then at renewal or termination. So have open communication throughout. Ask to have your internal resource stakeholders or your tiger team meet with the vendor periodically. It can be monthly, quarterly, depends how you utilize the tool. But have ongoing business reviews to evaluate the product both in terms of its own capabilities and utilization, but how well it's being used within the company. This is a great time to talk about resource challenges where people simply don't know how to use something or you don't know how best to use it. So have ongoing business reviews. This is a little different than some older software tools where you were sold something and then relied on sort of self-learning. Here to the extent it's possible, work with your vendors and have ongoing discussions. If you are having problems, this is a great way to raise them, even if your contract doesn't necessarily require the vendor to do anything about it. You will be faced, particularly with the larger providers with contracts that have a lot of protective wording on the legal front for what their responsibilities and liabilities are. But a good vendor wants to support their customers. And so these kind of conversations are a great way to talk about issues that maybe your contract doesn't mandate a remedy for. Again, use the criteria, KPIs, objectives for your organization that you created during those initial phases we just talked about to evaluate how the tool is meeting your needs. And maybe it doesn't, but you wanna think through this so that you can decide whether or not you're gonna continue with this tool, move to another or renew. Uh, for better or worse, you're sort of in a constant cycle here with some of these MarTech solutions where you're constantly implementing and renewing. And so in the interim, you need to be thinking about, you know, how well has the tool been integrated in your company? Are people actually using the product or is it just sitting on the shelf? How often is it being used? You know, has the tool met your ROI as you've defined it and calculated? Are you getting sufficient vendor support? Are they giving you the tools you need to evaluate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Have this business review so that you can assess and then better decide later at a renewal phase if it's worthwhile to keep this tool or begins considerations for something else. Don't wait. The vendors are open to having these kind of discussions. And so unlike some other industries, take the opportunity here to work with them to show how your tool is being used. As a part of these discussions, you know, it's a great way to hear about the roadmap, to hear about new features, to hear about new compatibility or integration or interoperability solutions. 
Uh, having a record of this is a great way to assess your vendor and also can be valuable when it finally gets time to have a renewal or renegotiation. Um, recall again, the earlier advice about the product roadmap. So if something wasn't ready at the time you signed initial procurement arrangement, it might be ready now. You want to be evaluating the vendor's performance and share your assessment of their performance with the vendor. You know, you can consider a scorecard if things are that formal or simply just go over open items that reflect issues that you've had. This might sound a little different, again, from the way you might have handled or treated other IT resources, but these tools are designed to sort of work hand in hand with your marketing department. And so take advantage of this to the extent you can. If your vendor is not being responsive to this kind of communication, that's something to assess. But good vendors want to own and continue these relationships. So I would think in most cases, they'd be open to this. And these reviews are also a great way to sort of determine what's happening with your vendor. There are a lot of MarTech tool providers out there and a lot of MarTech tools. Uh, over the last 10 years, this area has grown exponentially. At some point, there's going to be some consolidation here. So having these discussions is a great way to figure out if your vendor has been sold, has acquired another resource, or is being merged into another entity or whether various tools are being combined into another thing. You don't wanna get blindsided with something that you rely upon. And so this is a great way to sort of learn that input. We can't predict when this consolidation is gonna happen, but it just seems inevitable given how diffuse everything is within the industry. So similar to the discussions that are had during the business reviews, renewals provide a great opportunity to bring any existing issues with the tool to the vendor's attention and to hold vendors accountable to the expectations of what a tool is supposed to accomplish for you. So this would be a good opportunity um, to give feedback and improve upon your use of the tool, but also a good time to review whether the tool performed in the way that you wanted it to, um, and also whether the tool was cost-effective. Uh, was it targeting the right you know, customer segment? Um, and then also, um, use of the business reviews as a negotiation tool to negotiate better terms during uh, the renewal. So for example, if the maintenance and support um, during the term of the agreement and your use of the product um, was not you know, at your standards or was not sufficient, this would be a good opportunity to um, negotiate for more uh, in different levels of maintenance and support um, and then also do not be afraid to walk away if a tool is not performing well. Uh, there's no point in sticking with uh, a vendor or using a particular tool if it's not working. Uh, and Adrian, do you have anything to add? On that? Yeah, just to recap. So on the contract front, you're going to have to decide if you can or whether you're working with a vendor's contract or your own procurement document. But just to go back over things that you should always be trying to negotiate, discuss, data, data security, data storage, having a better understanding of maintenance boards, having some sense of how integration is gonna occur, whether there's a way to measure that, uh, go over fees, hidden costs, et cetera, defining your KPIs and having some ability to review and report or have reporting shared with you on those fronts. And then finally, where all this will be documented. Um, I mentioned in passing that you're not always going to understand what your contract package is, and you may not necessarily see at first the full set of legal terms. And so working through all that up front, or at least knowing where the information can be found, can be helpful simply because some of these tools are going to have online terms. Some of them might link to policy statements. Your organization or company might need to incorporate your own contract addenda or other terms. Uh, typically here is where you see the introduction of an information security or data privacy term or addenda. So you got to want to understand what's in your contract package so that you can manage that going forward. Um, I think we have a little bit of extra time to no go questions. through. No questions? Yep. Great. Well, uh, if you have any follow-up questions, there is our contact information and feel free to reach out. We're happy to answer anything Oh, oh, two. Okay, great. Let me see that. All 
Okay, so uh, the first question is, have you found success publishing or pushing your own forms with vendors or with a writer in specific terms of governing the document? This one is really going to vary. I would certainly advocate if you're on the client or customer side to push your own form. But if you're not successful in having that used, then it's perfectly appropriate to bring in pieces of it through a writer. Modification of the order documents sometimes will work. Um, where you can add terms to what's effectively the invoice or simply telling the vendor that although some of the standardized aspects of the relationship, you're fine using their contract. So there, if it's a license form, it's okay to be working from that, but the other pieces of it, you need to have your terms. So again, information security, data, et cetera. Um, so you're gonna mix and match there. I wish I could give you a more standard approach, but it's gonna vary. I also have to concede that with the larger, more prominent vendors in the space, you're gonna be using their form. Um, we have not heard instances with some of the larger providers of even the biggest companies getting away from their form. So don't be surprised if that's the case, but don't assume that that's all the legal contract you need to use. You certainly have opportunity to negotiate pieces of it. And we have certainly done that ourselves. All right, next question. Would you advocate having a right to stop service if dispute, including payment dispute? That depends. I, you know, I, I don't know how mission critical the MarTech solution or tool might be to your operations. If it is, you're going to want to be able to continue use pending a dispute. Uh, on the other hand, if continued use has an associated payment with it, then if it's not that important, it may not be something you need to push for as something that continues ongoing. Um, so it kind of varies there. Uh, I would say that typically the vendor is going to push for some kind of periodic renewal and ongoing subscription. If it's a more standard looking software form, they're going to have a remedy clause you may have seen before that says that there's something that they dispute, misuse of the tool, et cetera, that they have a right to spend. But you want to push back on that, certainly if the tool is mission critical. And you heard me mention that it's important to have transition assistance. And this kind of contradicts that if the vendor can turn things on and off. And bear in mind that in a lot of cases, notwithstanding the fact we want to tie payment as much as we can to performance, your vendor, certainly on the basic usage of a MarTech tool, is going to have you paying more in advance, or at least a portion of advance. So you already paid for this. And so I would certainly be pushing back on a unilateral suspension right that isn't well-defined. Are there any MarTech specific terms that differ from other SaaS agreements? This varies by provider. I think you would be surprised at how generic some of the agreements for a MarTech solution can look, especially with those providers that have other software products. They tend to leverage a rather generic looking form. So if you're familiar with a standard looking SaaS agreement, your MarTech form may not look that different. And that's both sometimes useful and then problematic. That's where you need to make sure you are accounting for the aspects of the relationship that may not be handled by a standard looking SaaS contract. And so data would be one respect. A lot of times services, professional services, such as consulting or unique support or implementation aren't addressed very well. So you may need to deal with services outside of the SaaS solution itself. These MarTech tools are not always just about plug and play platforms or applications. And so if services aren't being well addressed, you may need to add that, but that's a situation where you can have your services contract paired with their SaaS form if that's what you're seeing. Let's see, reading this live, so bear with me. Should the MSA govern any event of conflict between the MSA and the product's assignment? Uh, you know, I guess the answer to whether or not a MSA should govern a SOW or some kind of lower level task document will depend on how much you're utilizing the MarTech tool. Uh, if it's a 
more comprehensive tool. And certainly a lot of vendors are moving to solutions that kind of allow you to do more and more all with one um, tool or one platform, then you want the MSA to govern. On the other hand, if things are sort of more project oriented and you're moving in and out of various capabilities or tool offerings, it might be more appropriate to have a project assignment govern, particularly if you have different fee schedules. So if you like one vendor for one type of offering, but not for another, it may make more sense there to have the SOW. As a matter of drafting practice, I would advocate having the document that you spent the most time negotiating with legal be the document that supersedes. Sometimes what happens with these ancillary documents and SW, et cetera, is that it may not go through the full review. So you need to be a little bit careful about having them control if not everyone on your internal stakeholders team will see it. Uh, that also can be meaningful with respect to how much you're paying for it. Lower amounts don't necessarily surface as much as the initial procurement purchase item costs. So I'd be wary with project assignments controlling, but at the same time, I appreciate that the SOW or your lower level order document is more likely to articulate specifically what your fee is, what you're getting, support details. So in some respects, it almost has to control, but that means that your conflict clause can be specific. So the MSA otherwise governs except for a few things that must be articulated in your SOW or your order. Oh, I think it just answered that. Right, so um, I think if I were to take a general position again, this, this issue of which document governs, the one that you've spent the most time negotiating should govern. Um, notice I didn't say the MSA per se, because you may be presented with a situation where you can't negotiate what is otherwise considered the MSA. It's an online set of SaaS terms, for example, but your vendor is open to integrating certain changes through perhaps an order document, a writer, or some type of addendum. So that's the document you're negotiating. That one needs to control and then work your way down from there. Certainly certain document topics might need to be more controlled than others or worked out more mutually, so that's fine. If you have some opportunity to sort of control the doc because it requires mutual acceptance, then this notion of order of precedence isn't quite as important. But I have found from experience that MarTech solutions don't always have a singular contract that you see, usually as a package of documents. So this is a good question and also relates to knowing what your contract is so that you know what controls, what governs, what applies. Uh, and so, that's sort of the first point, which is evaluate what the contract package is, then establish order of precedence sort of based on what you negotiate and then kind of work down from MSA to SOW. Um, and SOWs and orders, again, tend to be more mutual signature acceptance. And so that's sort of your avenue to control what's in there. But if it isn't something that's negotiated with legal, it may not always be, then you need to be careful with it. I think that's it on the questions. Again, thanks everybody for joining us. If you have any follow-up questions, we'd be happy to answer them and have a great day. Thank you.